Okay, thanks for coming back, everyone. Um, yeah, we have arrived at our keynote, uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Christian Greer. Christian Greer is a historian of religions based at Harvard Divinity School at the Center for the Study of World Religions. He received his PhD at the University of Amsterdam and the Department for the History of Hermetic Philosophy for his dissertation with the title of Angel-Headed Hipsters, Psychedelic Militancy in 1980s North America. Christian Greer's research focuses primarily on heterodox religious movements within post-war North American counterculture. He has published on topics uh, such as the psychedelic church movement, deep ecology, esoteric anarchism, and joke religions that are serious, but also jokes. <laughs> he currently holds a postdoctoral fellow at the um, Transcendence and Transformation Research Initiative, which couldn't have been a more fitting name in light of the theme of this conference. Today, he will be talking about the potential for the study of esotericism to transform the way in which we construct narratives about the past, uh, present, and future. And he will also discuss a specific case from his own research into psychedelic spirituality. The title of his talk is The Transformative Potential of Researching Esotericism, Parliament Funkadelic as Case Study. Yeah, um, due to logistical reasons, Dr. Greer couldn't be with us physically, but he's with us online, which is great. So yeah, Christian, uh, thanks so much for being with us. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Am I coming in loud and clear? Yes. Loud, maybe not. All right, I'm going to share loud my and screen. Clear. And can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. I can hear people as well. That makes me feel a little bit more at home. Um, let me just start by saying that I'm overflowing with emotion. It's so nice seeing you all. Virtually, let's say. But really, I, the eyes of my heart are open, and they're, they're looking right at everyone there. Uh, as you see, I am going to be giving a talk, The Transformative Potential of Researching Esotericism, Parliament Funkadelic as Case Study. I'm J. Christian Greer. And there's my contact information. So feel free to, to message me. All right, let's jump into it. Again, um, let's see. Oops. Uh, I'm overflowing with emotion here, and it's an especially great honor to be giving the keynote at this conference. As looking out over Zoom, I recognize former students, colleagues, and friends who I have missed so dearly over the last year. The course of the pandemic has been very difficult, but it's things like this that really bring us all together. So I'd like to start by expressing my gratitude to the sponsors of this conference and all the attendees. And I mean that sincerely. Also, thanks are in order to Misha, Kakabaze, and Faith Pramuk for all of their hard work and perseverance in the face of incredible difficulties. Let's give them a round of applause, which I think they much deserve. And a real round of applause. I'm not just saying that, uh, if possible, let's give them a little bit of uh, attention there. Also, kudos are in order for the topic they selected for this inaugural student conference. Given the circumstances we're in and the level of confusion and uncertainty we have all probably grown accustomed to, I cannot think of a more apropos topic than varieties of transformation. To be sure, this esteemed gathering represents its own version of transformation insofar as we are now breaking ground on a new and very much needed forum for the study of esotericism. Being the first of its kind, the Esotericism and Variety of Transformation Conference is part of a larger process by which this field is being reshaped by a new generation of scholars with new agendas, new perspectives, new material, and a new interdisciplinary vision of our future. It is here in this forum that I'm reminded that the study of esotericism cannot and should not be reduced down to its most recognizable names, its most celebrated books, or its most innovative methodologies. Rather, it's a community enterprise. It's all of us. The study of esotericism is an organism of sorts that either grows, mutates, transforms, or it dies. This conference here, and more specifically, the scientific research that all of you have prepared, represents the ongoing and necessary process of growth, mutation, and transformation. In short, we are the transformation, we are the mutation that will keep this field alive 
in decades to come. Now, the title of my lecture mentions a case study, case study for the transformative potential of research in the And later in my talk, I will map out the ways in which my research into the world famous funk group, Parliament Funkadelic, offers a way to reconceptualize the history of post-war esotericism in the United States. But before moving into that aspect of my talk, I would like to shine a light on two other varieties of transformation at work currently in the study of esotericism. The first variety relates to the study of esotericism as a cooperative pursuit. I have named this portion of my talk, the us at play in the study of esotericism. The way esotericism is studied in and promoted is currently undergoing a revolution, which is being led by you, the junior scholars of esotericism. This is nothing new, as the academic discipline has been reshaped by successive generations of scholars, at least since the founding of the HHP in 1999. What makes the latest generation different though, is the abundance of technical savvy and an acute sense for the value of access to the study of esotericism. Now, some examples are in order. First, I would like to give special attention to Stephanie Shea, who has founded the podcast and video interview show, Rejected Religion. I myself have been a guest on this program, as have some speakers presenting at this conference. Hello, Brennan, see you there. And it is no exaggeration to say that Stephanie's insight, wit, and good nature are bringing what we do as scholars to esotericism to people that would simply never read any of our monographs, or articles. Rejected religion illustrates not only what we do, but the amount of interest there is in it by people outside of our field. Similar praise goes to Earl Fontenelle of Schweb, Secret History of Western Historians and Podcast, another graduate of the HHP who has produced an unambiguously highbrow podcast that delves into the secret history of Western esotericism. The secret here is that history is far more complicated than previous generations of scholars have indicated. And that the rejected knowledge of esotericism plays a far more influential role in human culture than previously suspected. Earl takes the exciting new findings from our field, the findings that we produce, and transforms them into lectures that are in plain English, as well as no bullshit interviews, which illuminates the blind spots in ancient culture, Western culture and popular culture for a very broad audience. Now, instead of setting the record straight once and for all, this secret history podcast underscores the explosive potential of research into esotericism, its capacity to overturn the apple cart of received wisdom and bankrupt the cheap truths of common knowledge. Switching gears, there's also correspondence. The Journal for the Study of Esotericism, edited by my friends, Dr. Aaron Rokema, Dr. Manon Hedenborg White, and Jimmy Elwood. It's hard to overemphasize the significance of a journal for the junior scholars of esotericism. As you may know, this peer reviewed journal should be the first place you think of when you're ready to submit your scientific research for publication, especially the ones you prepared for this conference. Why? Because the journal was specifically made for you. The implications are threefold. First, the journal is sympathetic to the methods and theories of esotericism, which means you won't have to explain why esotericism is important. Two, its audience will appreciate your insights. And moreover, be predisposed to integrating those insights into their own work. Finally, this is the journal that senior scholars read to tell which way the wind is blowing. Need an example? The editorial team does not include the term Western in the title of the journal. Need another? It's open access. Okay, I could go on to mention many more initiatives, such as Ninian's work on the HHP Instagram, and my dear friend McGunka's Occult South Asian Network. Again, these are fantastic initiatives. I could even mention this conference itself, but I think you get the picture. For those new to the study of esotericism, it may seem as though all the necessary information is hidden behind paywalls. 
locked behind unobtainably priced books and exclusive academic conferences. Though these barriers remain firmly in place, the student-led initiatives mentioned above nourish the study of esotericism by opening up new paths to the field, which is more important now than ever. I mean, I don't have to tell you that funding for the humanities is drying up by the day. With the global pandemic, liberal arts departments are being liquidated at an even more accelerated rate. If what we do as scholars of esotericism is going to survive, then it's going to be the result of initiatives, such as the ones I've mentioned above. These are revolutionizing the way in which esotericism is performed, promoted, and amplified, as well as absorbed by the people inside and outside of this room. Now, these scholarly endeavors speak in different registers. That's clear. And that's precisely their value. They are flexible in ways that the traditional academy is not. They've responded to innovations in technology, which means that the interests of the public as well as the scholarly world are addressed. And finally, they offer more equitable access to our field. In short, as a scholarly cohort, we have seen beyond the strictures that formally organize the study of esotericism and as podcasters, conference organizers, journal editors, Instagrammers, and of course, traditional scholars, we are poised to inherit the field and ensure its continued diversification and unfolding. Now, let me conclude this section by noting that I'm absolutely certain that this variety of transformation has only begun. It is said that every human has one great novel inside their head just waiting to be written. I reckon that's equally true for all of you sitting here today. However, instead of a novel, you possess a new means of conveying the study of Western esotericism, whether it's as a documentary filmmaker, comic book artist, graphic novelist, or host of a web series. Again, this particular variety of transformation awaits its further unfolding. With any luck, this conference too could be looked at by future historians as the launching pad possibly of projects that took esotericism to the next step. I mean, that's what conferences are for. So having looked at the collective variety of transformation, that's the us at work in the study of esotericism, I'd like to pivot to a more narrow topic. All of you. Now I'd like to begin this section with a quote that gets to the heart of the matter and teases the final part of this keynote. According to the leader of Parliament Funkadelic, George Clinton, if you're going to call on something to change, you're going to have to change what you call that thing. Comes from his memoir, Brothers Be Like Yo George, Ain't That Funk Kind of Hard On. Research into esotericism is undergoing a major shift, which is embodied partially in the publication of New Approaches to Esotericism, edited by Egil Asprom and Julian Sweet. This anthology addresses itself to the oversights in the foregoing study of esotericism. Calling for a methodological reorientation of the field, this anthology introduces critical insights from critical race theory, global history, and post-colonialism. The anthology, though, is simply a way marker for future shifts in the field. These are the shifts that you will make upon completing your graduate degrees, and especially your PhDs. Personally, I had no idea what to expect when I set out on the road as a novice esotericism researcher. Like any pilgrim embarking on a great journey, my disembarkation was a joyful moment of promise, anticipation, and expectation. However, it was not long before I found myself lost in a deep, dark wood. Without any strong indication of what I was supposed to be doing, I dove headfirst into reading every book on the academic study of esotericism and all the primary sources related to psychedelic culture, the subject of my PhD research. Nonetheless, after three years, I was thoroughly bewildered in the bewilderness of research. Oversaturated in other people's ideas, I was lost in the sauce. What was researching? How do people do it? And most importantly, when's lunch? These were the questions that occupied my mind, but somehow I made it through. Now, I recall in the weeks leading up to my PhD defense, my senior colleagues at the HHP all commented on my upcoming initiation. Though I could not see it myself, they recognized my defense as more than a step in the professionalization process. 
it, re it represented a major transformation, not simply in the way I positioned myself with respect to the field, but in who I was and how I communicated my ideas. By composing a dissertation and duly passing the PhD defense, I had somehow, by magic, I don't know, absorbed the hidden knowledge that separated me from those who were not professional scholars of esotericism. Though I was overjoyed, I was left with a strong feeling of puzzlement. Alone, reflecting by myself, it seemed like I had learned a bunch of little things, but I did not feel as though I had gained any singular transformative wisdom. So I thought about it more, not simply because this topic interested me, but on behalf of my partner and friends, we're likewise going through initiation processes themselves, grad school. The answer came unexpectedly, approximately eight months later during an informal office hours meeting with a student. I heard myself explaining just how the PhD did serve as an initiation into higher realizations, but it wasn't exactly me talking. It was like something else was speaking through me. It was one of those exceptionally strange moments that didn't seem strange until after it happened. How do I put this? It was like the conversation was carrying us, the student and I, to a faraway destination that we did not plan on going to. Okay, you're probably too eager to hear about this grand revelation, you know, the revelation about the PhD initiation. But first, I have a little aside to make. One of the best parts of researching esotericism is precisely all of those exceptionally granular historical insights you gain. Of course, these are the type of insights that only happen into obscure topics that are only known by obsessed fanatics and scholars. Well, the idea that a particularly good conversation has a life of its own has some interesting precursors, which I discovered accidentally while roaming the dense forests searching for my own PhD argument. For example, this weird idea about conversations appears in the good book, Matthew 10, or Matthew 18, 20. And I quote, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. In his imaginative analysis, the French professor Michel Serres similarly depicts Hermes as the ever-present third that presides over conversations. In fact, the late Genesis P. Orange explained it to me in contemporary terms. Magic passes through the touching of hands. On a related note, the occultural icons William S. Burroughs and Brian Geist called this idea the third mind. In their view, the melding of minds cannot be planned, but occurs unexpectedly during good conversations, dancing, joking around, and making love. It's as if something greater than the sum of its parts takes over, and points the way beyond what can be conceived individually. Finally, I recently learned that George Clinton of Parliament Funkadelic had a term for this type of individual collective self-actualization. He called it the funkification of the mind. But we'll get to that later. All of this is to say that researching esotericism is not all long, quiet years digging into dusty books or fanzines in my case. It's also about gaining insights into things that haven't necessarily been named yet. Okay, enough dancing around the issue. What was it that I learned when I was initiated into the community of full-fledged scholars of esotericism? I call it the grand scheme. <laughs> the grand scheme, that's right. Like climbing a mountain, it was not until I reached the top of the PhD process that I could see what was all around me. That is to say, I was able to recognize my place in the grand scheme of our profession. It goes like this. On the undergraduate level, you're trained to demonstrate proficiency with primary sources. On the level of the master's degree, you must master the secondary sources of your discipline. And as a PhD, you return to the primary sources, though not as a novice, but as a secondary source yourself. The key to this transformation is creating historical insights, which you then forge into neologisms. In, in short, you got to coin an innovative nominalization. Okay, let's turn to some examples. One of the most, one of my personal favorite innovative nominalizations 
is Marco Passi's negative epistemology. He coined this term in his criminally underrated article, Arthur Mackin's Panic Fears. It's a powerful idea, negative epistemology, which is yet to be explored for its full interpretive value. Another example is Carol Cusack's invented religion. Though I have not adopted this particular construction in my work, it nevertheless represents an important and innovative nominalization that broke ground in the study of psychedelic religion. Now, these flashy conceptualizations need not always be original. Negative epistemology, invented religion, those are original, but they need not always be. Here, I'm thinking about the Hennegraaff's concept of platonic orientalism. Now, he did not coin that term, but repurposed it to suit his revision of the dynamics that govern Western culture. The same is true for Christopher Partridge's A Culture, an immensely useful heuristic category that he, in fact, borrowed from Genesis P. Orange. Now, my advice about coining an innovative nominalization, a neologism, may seem rather frivolous. However, when it comes down to it, a lot of powerful things are just humbug. I mean, think about it. The Catholic or Gnostic mass, that can be reduced down to an assembly of smells and bells or the Freemasonic initiation, which combines stagecraft with practical effects, as Jay Kenney noted in his wonderfully unsensationalistic, the Masonic myth. So too, when I was lost in the bewilderness, another innovative conceptualization, so I let the drama of the research overcome me, and I was unable to regain my balance. However, by coining an innovative nominalization, I was able to achieve that balance once again. Forging, forging a term that encapsulated my argument provided the key to conveying my argument over and against the choir of voices that was otherwise deafening. Oh, that neologism that I coined? Psychedelicism. We'll return to that in the third part of this lecture. Now, this little insight proved to be decisive in getting me over the hill with respect to my own initiation transformation into a scholar of esotericism. So I wanted to pass it on to all of you now. To recap this section, I've touched upon the mechanics of PhD writing and mentioned the innovative nominalization strategy. In the next section, attention will turn to my case study, the Funk Music Collective Parliament Funkadelic. Here, I will demonstrate the way in which I've affected my own transformation of the master narrative of esotericism and the culture of identity within which it is embedded. Okay, so having passed through the us and then moved on to the you, now it's time for me, or rather my own research and the Parliament Funkadelic case study. So let's start with the necessary background on this overlooked but essential piece of psychedelic history. What is Parliament Funkadelic? Well, the short answer is, it's an expansive musical collective headed by, headed by George Clinton. It featured a rotating cast of characters, but had roughly 16 core members. Active from 1970 to 2014, Parliament Funkadelic released over 25 albums, from which they scored 13 top 10 hits and more than six number ones on the charts. The group itself, Parliament Funkadelic, is actually the amalgamation of two groups. The first one was founded in 1956. That's the Parliaments. And that was George Clinton's orig uh, uh, originary duop group, which he formed at the age of 15 in his hometown of Plainsville, New Jersey. Funkadelic was founded 14 years later, in 1970, after record company disputes prevented Clinton from recording under the name the Parliaments. By this time, Clinton and his friends were full citizens in the psychedelic world of the hippies. Over the next 50 years, George Clinton would release music as Parliament, as Funkadelic, and as the amalgamated group Parliament Funkadelic. Henceforth, I will be referring to Parliament Funkadelic as P-Funk. Now, alongside P-Funk, there were dozens and dozens of other side projects that took shape as a sort of popular funkadelic front, such as the Brides of Frankenstein, Bootsy Collins's Rubber Band, Parlet, and the Horny Horns. Here we can see some of those album covers. Now, these acts 
contributed concept albums that further embellished the funkadelic mythology, the P-funk mythology or funkology that was elaborated across parliament funkadelic musical compositions. And this elaboration happened along linear notes, the artwork of their album, their live shows, their music videos, their costumes. Really, it was a collective artistic enterprise. The P-funk ideology, funkology, was composed of a bricolage of esoteric themes drawn from the cultic milieu, including the ancient aliens thesis of Eric von Deinken's Chariot of the Gods, interstellar space travel, neo-Egyptian revelations, which all of which was synthesized with black power and black cultural nationalism, anti-war protests, sexual liberation, teachings from the process church of the final judgment, as well as the nation of Islam. And all of that was then synthesized and refracted through the psychedelic ideology. To be certain, P-Funk's influence on acid culture in the 1970s was enormous. In fact, a bit more should be said about that influence. While scholars have rightly apprehended the way in which funk and P-Funk in particular dominated Anglophone popular culture in the 70s, they have yet to recognize the continuity between the hippies psychedelic culture of the 60s and the funkadelic era that followed it in the 70s. The reason for this oversight will become apparent shortly. Suffice it to say that the funkadelic ideology transformed psychedelic culture to the extent that it was unrecognizable to historians and scholars alike. And at the heart of that transformation was the funk. So we may rightly be asking, what is the funk? At the most superficial level, funk is a genre of music predominantly performed by black musicians. However, looking deeper, funk is an attitude. It's a way of being in which bodily, bodily coordination is harmonized with a suppleness of the mind. It's a new type of cool in which authenticity, the core of hip, has opened up into spiritual self-mastery. Now, drawing deep from the well of Black religious vernacular, being funky is akin to having soul, the spirit, over and against the multitudes of plastic people trapped by their own ignorance and unfunky inhibitions. P-Funk not only inherited this longstanding interpretation of funk, but reshaped it into the space age or Afrofuturist complex termed funkology. Now here is the funkological mythology in a nutshell. All people were born with funk, which is, which is synonymous with, with the divine spark of Gnosis. The unity of mind, body, spirit is channeled through a higher faculty of perception, which is subsequently atrophied, which is subsequently atrophied as a result of civilization. With the connection to the life force severed, humanity has fallen into race hatred, war, death, and disco. <laughs> Enter P-Funk, high priestess, high priests of higher consciousness, here to restore the imaginative faculty associated with funk. P-Funk was first and foremost a psychedelic collective. Contrary to the foregoing assumptions of music historians and rock critics who remain preoccupied with the development of their sound, Parliament Funkadelic positioned itself in the psychedelic world of consciousness expansion. Following psychedelic music collectives such as the Grateful Dead and Jefferson Airplane, P-Funk conceptualized their live events as acid conclaves in which the musical performance was secondary. On a more fundamental level, a P-Funk show was a liminal zone in which acid was distributed, consumed, and celebrated along with the conscious expansion it occasioned within an atmosphere that was conducive to even further elevating the resulting alteration of consciousness. This same dynamic is at play today in psychedelic festivals such as Burning Man, Nowhere, and Zora. PFUN concerts were staged as over-the-top productions which centered around a mass UFO abduction. These multi-hour theatrical spectacles enlisted a small army of light and sound technicians who transformed large sports stadiums into multi-sensory environments for tens of thousands of people. 
the foremost and essential item for all P-Funk fans, aside from the acid, was a flashlight, which they used to illuminate the stage at key moments. Now, one such moment came as the climax of the P-Funk show. When the neon ambience was abruptly darkened, thereby signaling the arrival of the Funkadelic mothership. Illuminated by the crowd's flashlights, this massive structure floated overhead, landed on stage, and expelled alien emissaries who, with futuristic love guns, restored the audience's funk, and then enjoined them to board the ship for a space ride into a funky eternity of good vibes and great sex. All of this is to say that P-Funk and their live events maintain the freewheeling psychedelic spirit, uh, psychedelic spirit associated with the so-called hippies long past the supposed end of the 60s. In fact, they took it far into the future, way far into the future. It's funk. Now, P-Funk were not the first artists to take the traditions of black music, musicians into what Aldous Huxley termed the antipodes of the mind. Two prominent influences here were Jimi Hendrix and Sly and the Family Stone. Now, this is not a musicological talk, so I will cut my analysis of the P-Funk sound short, mentioning only that what we associate with classical rock and roll, Dylan, the Beatles, Clapton, was in fact initially derived from black music developed in the early 20th century by black musicians in the Mississippi Delta. Now, listening to Sgt. Pepper, and other acid rock pioneers, Parliament Funkadelic, for their part, reflected these black musical traditions through a psychedelic lens. Okay, all of this is to say that it's impossible to delineate a linear progression of musicological influence. The Funkadelic sound emerged out of a collaborative complex of musicians from a diverse range of backgrounds. That said, there was only one P-Funk. Here, I'd like to zoom in on one album in particular, out as it speaks to the core esoteric element of P-Funk. Free Your Mind and Your Ass Will Follow, 1970. This was the title of Parliament Funkadelic's second studio album, produced in 1970, just a few months after their first one. The record was an experiment for the 16-person collective who wanted to break through the outer limits of consciousness expansion. The group made it no secret that they laid down the entire album while consuming an astonishing amount of LSD. Furthermore, they encouraged their fans to go similarly out of their heads while consuming their music. Here is the primary esoteric element of P-Funk. The funkadelic message of the music was encoded in acid consciousness. P-Funk was high when they sent out their flash of illumination and their audience should likewise expand their minds in order to get it. As with many psychedelic rock groups, P-Funk did not regard the use of mind altering substances as an escape from reality. In fact, it's the reverse that's true. Psychedelicizing their minds provided them with access to higher orders of mystical understanding, which they laid down on wax and communicated in their live performances. Their spiritualized view of LSD is, mir is mirrored in the title of their album, Free Your Mind and Your Ass Will Follow. Here, Parliament Funkadelic reiterates the hippie's principal religious imperative. Self-actualization is the basis of all transformative social change. Utopia begins in the head and then the hand. Riffing on Leo Tolstoy's proclamation of Christian idealism, the kingdom of God is within you, George Clinton announced, free your mind and your ass will follow. And thousands did. At the height of their popularity in the, 19, at the late 1970s and early 80s, they packed upwards of 20,000 people in the stadiums across the world. Now, here are two points about parliament that deserve to be underscored. Formed at the end of the psychedelic era, P-Funk uh, reached its apex in the mid-1980s during the war on drugs. And the other thing to keep in mind is that Parliament Funkadelic was not underground. They routinely graced the covers of commercial magazines, performed in Hollywood films, and earned top spots on the billboard charts. In fact, 
They were inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1997, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Okay. Despite their impact, P-Funk does not necessarily appear, or despite their impact, P-Funk does not appear in the histories of psychedelic culture. Here, let me pull back for a minute so we can get a bird's eye view of this case study and its significance to esotericism. Now, having taught esotericism for a few years, I'm accustomed to hearing students tell me about fascinating topics that have not received any attention in the historical record. The prospect of adding new elements to the historical record always elicits excitement in both myself and the students. And here, let me be as explicit as possible. Most things have been left out of the historical record. In other words, claiming something has been left out of the historical record is an insufficient warrant for historical research. These gaps, however, provide clues for much deeper and potentially transformative questions. So instead of simply demanding that scholars add Parliament Funkadelic to their narratives of psychedelic culture, I have researched a more troubling question. Why has a Parliament Funkadelic appeared in the historical record of psychedelic culture? Again, my first task as a critical historian of esotericism is not to fill in the gaps. It's to explain why the gaps exist in the first place. So, the lack of attention given to P-Funk is the result of a scholarly construct, the counterculture. The principal means of interpreting psychedelic spirituality, the counterculture scholarly model has mischaracterized the history of consciousness expanding drugs in the post-war era. Leading scholars astray for the last 70 years, the term counterculture affirms the normative and ill-informed cultural bias against psychedelic use, which the academy absorbed via the US government's war on drugs. So why should scholars stop using the term counterculture? Here's four reasons. First reason. Born out of the Cold War paranoia surrounding deviancy, this piece of sociological jargon is ahistorical, which means that it does not afford an opportunity for nuance in the subject it's explaining. Though commonly applied to the post-war period, the so-called counterculture has been imputed to earlier eras and epochs. However, the connection between countercultures of various time periods has never been explicitly mapped out. In fact, this vagary extends to the typographic conventions governing the term itself. Is it counterculture hyphenated? Counterculture, one word, or counterculture, two words. All three appear in the literature. No explanation has been given. Two, the term is simply inaccurate. Looking at the principal object to which the term is applied, 60s counterculture, it's clear that psychedelics were psychedelicists were fat fascinated by innovation and newness and kickstarting the paradigm shift that would take us to a higher order of consciousness. Defining psychedelic users according to what they opposed skews the data towards normative values. Three, the term ignores the obvious. The so-called counterculture has been absorbed by mainstream culture since its arrival into public consciousness. LSD altered the Western cultural superstructure, as Thomas Frank has shown. The conquest of cool is evident across cultural domains, technology, music, literature, art, fashion, film, politics, music, religion, you name it. It's only now, half a century after the arrival of LSD, that scholars are coming, term, coming to terms with the repercussions of this event. If there ever was a counterculture, it is almost it has always almost been undistinguishable from mainstream culture. Four, and this is the final one. The concept of counterculture tends to be coded as something that white people do. In fact, the racial coding can be traced genealogically. It can be traced genealogically back to its popularization in Theodore Rozak's The Making of the Counterculture, published in 1969. Rozak did not invent the term counterculture. That's clear. But his massively successful study, The Making of the Counterculture, enshrined it both in public and scholarly discourse. 
This historian wrote not as a disinterested scholar, but as a partisan of the revolt erupting all around him in the late 60s. For Razak, humanity's only hope for overthrowing the totalitarian establishment, what he called the technocracy, was not the political protesters of the new left, it was not the feminists, nor was it the Black Panthers. In Razak's view, it was the white middle class, the Bohemians. Now, the making of the counterculture, the book's most salient feature is the author's overtly paternalistic tone. In short, Razak knew what was best for the counterculture, and Razak was there to tell you what it was. His self-satisfied paternalism reached a climax in a chapter-long repudiation of the psychedelic movement, tell tellingly entitled The Counterfeit Infinity. Here, he decried the hippies' heavyweight obsession with psychedelics as a distraction from what he knew was the true essence of the new consciousness of the hippies. By his account, Drugs were the only major flaw in what was otherwise an ideologically correct movement. In other words, Razak needed a way to glorify the new romantic consciousness of the hippies, but also conceal the centrality of psychedelics, thus the counterculture. His intellectual sleight of hand has had detrimental effects on the study of psych psychedelic spirituality ever since. Here, I would like to restate my argument in more provocative terms. The movement of psychedelic groups like P-Funk is not a feature of the counterculture, but the reverse is true. The so-called counterculture is a poorly defined way to talk about the religious awakening that erupted out of the late 60s psychedelic boom and which developed into the funkadelic culture of the 70s. As the P-Funk case study makes clear, the psychedelic ideology spread across all classes, all genders, and all races. It did not somehow end when the white people of the 60s mutated into the, the conformance of the 70s. LSD saturated the fabric of American society. Psychedelic spirituality reconfigured religious experience in the modern era. At the core of this reconfiguration was the simple fact LSD broke the monopoly on the mystical union with the God. The fact that the infinite could be accessed by anyone at any time, just by eating a piece of paper or popping a mushroom cap, created an entirely new mode of religiosity, which America has readily exported and sometimes imposed across the globe. In short, the counterculture encodes an opposite, in, in, dig it. The term the counterculture encodes an oppositional bias into groups like P-Funk, which implicitly and explicitly obscures their actual beliefs, practices, and historical developments. Therefore, replacing the term counterculture opens up a new historical avenue. It opens up many new historical avenues, such as the one I'm following. So my research has focused on dismantling the conceptual apparatus of the counterculture. And in the process of deconstruction, I have discovered that religious innovation and not opposition or deviance is the core feature of psychedelic spirituality. As you may have guessed, I applied my findings to create an innovative nominalization, psychedelicist. I coined the descriptor psychedelicist and the noun psychedelicism as a direct response to the narratives that suggest mind-expanding drugs are merely intoxicants and represent a constituent element of a purely oppositional counterculture. Instead, these terms refocus scholarly attention on how a wide range of alternative religious groups, including P-Funk, embraced psychedelic drugs not as an agent of rebellion, but of transcendence. And how religious innovation and not deviance is the core feature of P-Funk as well as other psychedelicist groups. In sum, the term psychedelicist and psychedelicism underscores the utopian agenda of acid culture and the positive aims that inspired 
and pushed psychedelicist idealists like P-Funk forward. Now, referring, um, okay, so what happens when we take away the concept of counterculture and instead use psychedelicists? Well, instead of presuming that psychedelicists have always been on the other side of mainstream culture, scholars can now observe psychedelicism as a popular movement free to take on different forms and discourses within popular culture, within modernity itself. One such discourse is P-Funk. Now, when examined as a continuation of the utopian communitarianism of the 60s, the P-Funk Collective emerges as the site of an alternative configuration of social justice. The significance of P-Funk goes beyond their contributions to American music, which are substantial as their induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1997 illustrates. In fact, even more significant is their message of racial harmony insofar as their concerts acted as a nucleation point for an alternative and thoroughly psychedelic strain of civil rights to take root. Carrying the torch for the coalitions of Christian dissidents that famously led the early civil rights movement, the psychedelic strain of social justice has reappeared in full force in today's Black Lives Matter protests. P-Funk represents the missing link. Also, if we use psychedelicists instead of counterculture, we see that P-Funk and their brand of psychedelic social justice has reemerged more recently as the moral conscious of the psychedelic renaissance. As the name suggests, the psychedelic renaissance claims to be a rebirth renaissance, and in so doing, effaces the psychedelicist activism of the recent past of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And this is precisely the era of P-Funk. P-Funk has been effaced, and the idea is by using psychedelicists and psychedelicism as categories, we can recover that voice. We can recover that strain of psychedelic social justice. Okay, okay, okay. I've spoken long enough, and I hope to have illustrated some of the points I've made throughout my talk. I will bring this lecture to a conclusion once, I'll bring this lecture to a conclusion, not once more, finally, I'll bring it finally to a conclusion by reminding all of the students of esoterics that the future of this exciting field belongs to them, belongs to their insights, belongs to their interests. So be bold, be innovative, and let's work together on making a new era of esotericism research. Thank you so much for your attention.